I'm ready to be transformed. I love it. Now, um, this series, Love Digs, we started off, just to catch you up a little bit, uh, talking about I dig difficult people. And what does it feel like when you have people in your life that, that you just, you know, have a hard time with or you can't stand, to be frank. And uh, Pastor Dave did an amazing job learning that or teaching us that. And then last week, Tina and I talked about I dig my marriage, I dig my husband, I dig my wife, I dig my spouse. And we talked about removing things that burden us in our marriage and getting down to the gold. Now, um, the reason we titled this series uh, Love Digs is because... Um, in all of these areas, we want you to understand, it's a slang term from, everybody thinks it's from the 60s and 70s, but it, it was even before that. But it's really a slang that most of us have heard that just says, oh, I, I dig it. Can you dig it? Look at somebody right now and say, can you dig that? All right. <laughs> Which means I, I'm totally into it or I like it. So th that's one reason we chose the series topic. But the second reason we titled our series Love Digs in all of these, whether it's difficult people, our marriage, and then today I dig my kids, um, is this, is because you're going to have to dig deep for the most meaningful relationships in your life to be life-giving and healthy. It's going to take work. Last week we talked about marriage. Today I dig my kids. And I mentioned last week as we were talking about that, that your marriage is a great example for your kids to follow when it comes to establishing healthy relationships. Now, I dig my kids. Uh, I, I do. Here's a picture of my kids. I want to show you a picture of my family. Uh, these are all of my children. And uh, this is my son-in-law, Guillermo, or Guillermo, all right? Um, don't make fun of me, guys, all right? It's Guillermo. They're just trying to help a hick with those rolling L's, all right? Um, this is my son-in-law, G. Um, <laughs> my daughter, Courtney. And, uh, of course, Courtney works for us, and she leads worship and runs our social media. And Brooke lives in Dallas, and then, of course, Tina and I. And then my daughter, Alex, lives in Denver. And then Macy is sitting right over here on my left. She works in our kids' men uh, as well. But these are my children, and I dig my kids. Now, um, ladies and gentlemen, this is like any other picture you may see of families. How many know that you stage pictures to look like that? <laughs> you with me on that? And boy, doesn't that look like a happy family? But how many also know that that's not what, always, that's not what it always looks like behind the scenes? Wouldn't you love to have a GoPro in your car when you're talking to your kids and really see what happens with mom and dad. Wouldn't you love to have a, a photographer in the house taking the real life pictures of what it looks like when family get together? You know, this is stage, but how many remember these days right here? Look at this next picture right here. That's not stage right there, all right? That's real life when it comes to our kids. Let's look at the next one right here. Can anybody identify with that right there? How about this one right here? And then this one, I love this. Shopping carts, ladies and gentlemen. And then the last one, right there. That's not stage. So you, you don't make those up, but, but listen, when I ha had that with my kids, here was the last picture is my solution to all of that right there. And that's this one right here, all right? How many single parents do we have in the building? Would you just raise your hand, single mom, single dad? Let's give all these single parents a big hand. Great job, guys. There is such a broad dynamic of parenting. How about, how about family members or grandparents that may be raising families, kids right now? Would you raise your hands if you're in the building? Look around here, you guys. Great. Um, okay. How many have kids under five years old in the, in the house? All right. So you get it. The pictures I just showed. <laughs> you, can you identify with all of those hanging off of shopping carts? Um, how about parenting if you're parenting um, someone or kids from the age of six to 12 year olds? Okay. Junior high. Raise your hands. Awesome. Okay. We're kind of getting an idea. And then everybody parenting teenagers. Lift your hands. Oh, yeah. Somebody's like, me. 
In Jesus' name, all of these hands parenting teenagers right now. You see them, Lord. You see them, Lord. Somebody's like, say it again, Pastor. You see them, Lord. Um, okay, how about parenting adult, adults, okay? You have adult kids? Sure. All of us. And that's kind of where, where Tina and I land. Um, I, I wanted just to show you around at all the dynamics of parenting. And, and here it is. Parenting, no matter how, no matter who, no matter in what capacity you're doing it, is not easy. It's not easy. There's a lot of pressure in parenting. And I have no doubt that we all want to do a great job. But am I the only one that has felt like parenting at times that I'm lost? I don't, I don't know what I'm doing. I, I come up against situations and, and some of them I feel in control and some of them I feel out of control and I, I just am lost. Am I the only one that has ever come to this feeling that says, okay, I'm now failing my kids at being a parent. And the enemy will cause us to think that way and, and deceive us in our thinking. There was a season when T and I, uh, we were traveling a lot in the ministry and um, when we had to leave our girls, we would get them together. And I remember setting them down. And uh, until they got old enough, we would either bring either one of my parents in or sometimes just a, a babysitter to stay with them. And it would be pretty lengthy periods of time because we were traveling to different states, different countries. And we would set them down and say, okay, girls, we're leaving. But here's the, uh, here's the lockbox and the safe. All of the paperwork is signed that this happens if something should happen to mom and dad. Now, I think back at that, and we really didn't think about it at the time. But I look back at that, and I'm like, oh, my gosh, how traumatic was that for our kids to, to set in that moment? But we had done that so much, and then I had been traveling so much, I started missing important events. I started missing important things in their life. And for a while, I was a little bit of a, an absentee father. I was picking up conversations on the phone and, and trying to parent on the phone. Well, the enemy began to work against me and started convincing me that I was failing as a father. And I specifically remember getting my girls together. And, and they, were, uh, they were in high school. A couple of them were in high school. And I asked them, I'm like, girls, am I doing all right as a parent? Now, that may be a little dangerous for some of you to ask your kids that. Um, but I was dealing with such a weight and a burden of how I was feeling, how the enemy was making me feel. I wanted to ask my kids if I was doing all right as a parent. And literally, I said, I, I don't want you to come back 10 years from now and say this was the moment that I screwed up your life. And I was being really serious because I felt like, that my role as a parent was diminished in their life. I would also feel like, okay, I've got four girls. I was raised by uh, my father, who's a strong man, and uh, mostly brothers. I did have a baby sister, but my, my dad parented us with some real toughness. And, and I found myself even parenting my own kids, my own daughters, with a, a, the same degree of toughness that my dad was parenting me. And, and so that was kind of a weight on, on my heart as well. My, my point is, what the enemy will do to us as parents is open doors or open thoughts that you're failing as a parent. We all feel pressures in parenting, no matter how it may appear, because parenting is complicated. It's hard. Now, if you feel like you failed or you may, be, you may feel like you're failing right now, I hope over the next 20 or 25 minutes that you come out of this thinking, okay, I've got help and God is going to help me. And I want to share some things that help me really dig in to my kids because it takes work to remove some of that overburden and get them on a trajectory that is in Christ. So here, here's a few things I want to share with you today. If you dig your kids, if you dig them, love them. If you dig them, love them. Now, you're like, duh, Pastor Joe, they're my kids. I love them. Come on. Not all the time we don't love them, okay? There are moments when we just get so aggravated. You're like, oh, my gosh, what is going on? But not all the time do we feel that overwhelming love. But we do love our kids. But there's a way to love our kids. And um, it's a love that is teaching the characteristics of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. Oftentimes we go to that verse and reference it when it comes to personal relationships or marriage relationships. It's the love chapter in the Bible. I call it the no-nonsense 
uh, chapter of love as you read it in the Bible. We're going to read it here in a second. But the reason that I called it that is because my daughter sent me, a, a Alex, who's in Denver, she sent me a birthday card. And as I opened that birthday card, she was like, happy birthday, Dad. I love you. And then she writes this. She goes, thank you so much for raising us and being a no-nonsense dad. Now, I started thinking about that. And I'm like, okay, I can, I can get down with that. But then I started, I was like, wait a minute. Happy birthday, dad. I love you so much. Thank you for being the funnest dad ever. How come she couldn't write that? Thank you for being the sweetest dad ever. Happy birthday, dad. Thank you for being the best provider ever. And, and as I started processing that, uh, when, when my birthday card came from Alex, I, I started putting some things together and I'm like, okay, that, that really is something that I wanted to show my kids as I was raising them that there were some things that were no nonsense in our house. Nonsense, as you go look at it, it just re- means contrary to what is good. How many know there's a lot of things in our world and a lot of things that happen in our lives and there's a lot of things that, we, that our kids even see and they are nonsense, ladies and gentlemen, because they are contrary to what is good for their life. Nonsense means things of no importance or value. So when I say no nonsense, basically I'm putting value on how I lead my children. I'm watching out for what happens in their life. And I am being a parent that protects my kids in, in, as, as they are being raised. Now, let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4 through 8. And I want you to see this, what I call the no-nonsense chapter of love. But I want us to apply it to principles and characteristics that we teach our kids. 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 8. Ready? Love is patient. All these things, I want you to jot them down. I've got some underlines there. But I want you to recognize these are all characteristics that we teach our kids. Love is patient. Love is kind. Love does not envy, it does not boast. I can look at all of these things and realize as I was raising my children and and now they're adults and Macy's still in the house, that some of these, there there was some nonsense that went on that that they were not patient and they were not kind. There's a reason that we told them, find somebody at school, the school lunch table, sitting by themselves and sit with them. You know why? Because we were teaching them kindness. Doesn't envy, it doesn't boast. Love is not, it is not proud. It does not dishonor. Um, that means we're teaching honor. The greatest things that we were able to learn from our parents growing up was honor. I loved how my mom and dad taught us honor. They would say it like this, honor your elders. Honor your mom and dad. Honor others. Love is not self-seeking. Love is not easily angered. That means we're teaching our kids if they're struggling with the emotion of anger, how to manage that. And we're not having any nonsense go on in our house to where fear and anger and rage controls everything that happens in our house. It keeps no record of wrong. Love does not delight in evil. Here's the other thing that we were taught the most. Honor and, are you ready? It rejoices with truth. How many want your kids just to tell the truth? Just tell us the truth. And then love protects. It always trusts. It hopes. I love that we were able to teach, Tina, our kids to persevere. Uh, Things that were difficult in their life. We didn't let it roll over them and beat them up. But truly, a no-nonsense love says, hey, we're going to work through this together because God's got a plan for your life. And then you guys, these last three words, verse number eight, say these with me. Are you ready? Love never fails. Love never fails. As we are looking at some of these things and we're like, okay, duh, pastor, we love our kids. But are we teaching a love that incorporates these characteristics in their life and watching out on how they respond to these, whether with no nonsense or they're doing good at doing. When we teach our kids to love, we do it teaching them to love God with all their heart, soul, mind, and strength. What we're teaching them is how to dig out a place to lay a foundation that they will have for the rest of their life. Teaching them the characteristics of 1 Corinthians chapter 13 early in their lives is like loaning them strength when they need it the most. 
It's like loaning them strength when they're weak. It's like recognizing the things that they're not doing that they should be doing that's gonna set the foundation of their life because they don't know any better. And it takes all of us to begin to teach those principles. Proverbs 22 and six, it says, start children off in the way that they should go. And when they are old, they will not depart from it. What if we did it like this? Start children off in the way they want to go. Just do it in the way that they want to go. And when they're old, they'll not depart from it. It's not what the word of God says. It says start children off in the way they should go. Which way should they go? First Corinthians chapter 13. We're creating some no nonsense in our home and saying, I see the things that I can grow in, that can become strength, that I get to impart to my kids, that give them an opportunity to have a great foundation for their life. Last week, Tina and Pastor Joyce, they were jotting notes down and she was talking to us about this process of loving our kids and digging our kids. Um, and, and she started sending some things to T and Tina was sending them to me. And I just took some of those because I, I love Pastor Joyce. She's a powerful woman of God and one of the pastors in our house and she leads our cares team. But even right now, as an elder in our church, she is basically saying, Pastor, I am still learning how to parent. I'm still working at parenting because it's hard. She said, I want to be present is what she told us. She said, I want to be present when my kids come in and I want to sit by them at the dinner table. And I want to, when they call, be present and not just merely hear their voice, but hear what they're actually saying. She said, I, I don't want to always dwell on what they've done wrong or what they didn't do or the chores that they may have forgot to do. But I want there to be a time to instruct. But when they are in the room, I want, I love this, guys. I want to make it count. And sometimes our kids come in and out of rooms in our life or in and out of our house. And I want every moment. Now, I know sometimes we get in a rush and, and sometimes there's, there's things going on in life and it's just moving quickly. But there are also moments when you just have to pause and not be distracted and make moments with your kids count. When you dig your kids, they can feel that love because you're making it count. Be present in the conversation. Don't get distracted by wrongs and failures. And, and I love what she concluded with. She said, God showed me this because our heavenly father, he doesn't do that to us. He's just glad that we're sitting in his presence so that we can talk with him. So as God shows us that, then as parents, Take time to hear what your kids are saying. If you dig your kids, then you're going to love them and enjoy being present with them. Here's the second thing. If you dig them and you love them, then you're going to disciple or, uh, discipline them. So if you dig your kids, then you got to discipline them. I can't believe nobody just didn't clap right there and say, don't say that again right there, all right? Come on. I dig discipline. Now, I'm not going to tell you how or debate best methods because we may all have different currencies that allow us to discipline our kids. Biblical discipline, ladies and gentlemen, it begins by establishing parental authority in the home. You see, God has given us parents uh, to have authority over our children. So in other words, are you ready? Let me say it plainly. You're in charge. You're in charge, not because you're bigger, not because you're stronger, not because you're smarter, but because God has placed you, are you ready, in authority on his behalf. I'm taking some pressure off of you right now because as you parent your kids, if you are unclear about your authority as a parent, then you're not going to be able to provide spiritual leadership that your child needs. Because he's placed you as authority on behalf of your kids as you represent God. There's going to be a lack of consistency. There's going to be a lack of boundaries that will regularly change. It'll be a passive approach to the home. And your child will eventually lose respect for you because you haven't taken the authority that God has given you as a parent. You see, our culture swings between two faulty forms of authority. One of them is harsh control and the other one is permissive freedom. Sometimes we can too harshly control, even to the point of abuse. 
Sometimes we give far too much permission that give our kids freedoms that they really shouldn't have being the age that they are. God wants us to instruct as parents to exercise authority by training our children. Are you ready? To live obediently under God's authority. He uses us to teach obedience to our kids. Our efforts are not merely to make our kids do what we want them to do. You're like, well, my kids are going to do what I want them to do. No, you know why I feel like I take the authority from God and the responsibility of parenting? Because I want my kids to do what God wants them to do. And that's my role, to teach them that obedience, to honor God and to obey. And when a child disobeys a parent, ultimately it is God who's being disobeyed because the child is rebelling now against the authority that God has placed in their life. Because if we don't teach obedience, then they miss the foundation. Because it's obedience that becomes the foundation for all the other things that we teach. As we teach 1 Corinthians chapter 13, patience, kindness, anger and and what's good and what's not. All of those things without obedience, parents cannot begin to focus on character development or spiritual growth. And that's what we're there to help our children do. I want you to jot this down in your your journal or take a note of this in your phone. Ephesians chapter six, verse one through three, it talks about obedience being the first commandment with a promise. So when we're talking about our kids obeying, we know that as they obey, then there are some promises that God God provides for them, and I don't want my kid to miss out on the promises of God. See, the purpose of discipline is training. Discipline starts with a heart to train and an opportunity to stay consistent in doing it. The goal of discipline is not to have obedient children, but eventually have healthy adults that don't lean on their own understanding, but as they learn who God is, in all their ways, they will acknowledge him. And the word says, he will direct their path. They have a lot more paths after they live out of home than when they live in the home. And by showing them what that means, that opportunity to grow with them and teach them biblical parenting, then you're going to set some paths for them that are going to be valuable. Tina and I learned a valuable lesson several years ago, and our primary goal was to guide our children, not to guard our children, because we know that they're going to do things in their life that we don't necessarily approve of, but what does it look like as we come back around and begin to guide them? And we have to do that by our faith. Our faith has been our primary guide when it comes to the discipline of our kids. Uh, Psalm 127, 1 through 4 It starts like this, unless the Lord builds the house. Everybody say unless. Unless. Say it one more time. Unless Unless the Lord builds the house, the builders labor in vain. Unless the Lord watches over the city, the guards stand watch in vain. In vain you rise early and stay up late, toiling for food to eat. For he grants sleep to those he loves. Look at that. Unless God builds it, we'll toil and we won't be able to sleep. It'll be restless. But if God builds it, then we'll rest and we'll have peace in our home. Verse number three. Children are a heritage from the Lord. Offspring, a reward from him. Notice that word. When they're a a, a heritage from the Lord, then our offspring become a reward. Verse 4 says, and like arrows in the hand of a warrior. And I like this because as we're talking about parenting, we are fighting for our kids, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to war for them. We're going to spiritual war. And we are taking authority over the enemy of their life by saying, I want to help guide them. So they're like arrows in the hands of a warrior are children born in one's youth. So there's a condition on parenting according to Psalm 127. Who's the builder? Is it television? Is it video games? Is it next door neighbors? Teachers at school? Who, who, who are the builders? Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And that's the question. Who is building, uh, who's building your family? The scripture says it's in vain and we we can't work hard enough to make it succeed and do it our way. We can't guard it with enough vigilance. We'll never sleep soundly unless God builds the house. And ladies and gentlemen, we are not designed to be perfect parents. 
Nobody in here is designed to be a perfect parent, so it will never be that way. But the psalmist David reminds us of something so simple, and it's to turn the responsibility back over to God instead of living a panic-stricken life like we've always failed, we're never going to get it right, and let God have his way in your family. Unless the Lord builds the house, they labor in vain who build it. And then I love our children become a reward to us. I was sitting over there during that song, and, um, and, and that so will I. And, and I was watching my daughter up here just thundering away, leading that song in worship. And my chest was beating out of my chest, or, uh, or my heart was beating out of my chest as she was singing it. And, and as I was looking up there, I saw the reward of discipline. Not, not because she's up here, but because she's living for God. She, she loves God, and you can see that passion in her, and it, and it was tangible for me today. And, and I thought, God, thank you for, for letting me take the arrow and put it in my hand and shoot it the way it should go when I was supposed to do that. Don't, don't let me deflect my responsibility in doing that. And what if I wouldn't have? What if there were moments in Courtney's life when she needed the discipline, and I said, uh, I, I don't want to hurt her little feelings, and, and she's going to figure it out on her own. Would she be standing up here passionately going after God, or would, would, wherever she is at in her life? I, I remember, I was thinking about moments of discipline for Courtney, and, and listen, Co Courtney was our really sweet child when she was younger. She's gotten a little more ornery since then, but she was really sweet. <laughs> Courtney would come in and she would, in the morning before school tea, she would make everybody's, all the girls' lunch and nobody would tell her to. And Courtney would put their name on the bag and like, hey guys, I, I got your lunch uh, ready for you. So Courtney was just one of those sweet kids. And I'm like, okay, that, that's, that's the reward of discipline. And, and she was just always doing good things at school. Well, she, she joined the basketball team her freshman year. And, um, and she played basketball for that one year. And her team was really, really bad. But to her credit, she was the best one on the team. And she wasn't really good either, all right? Um, I, I think she had a career high in one game. And it made the local newspaper. And Tina actually cut it out. Courtney had a career high four points in one basketball game, all right? And she made the paper. Literally says, Courtney Skiles led the way for the Web City Lady Cardinals with, with four points, all right? Um, but she was the best one on the team, and, and we cut that out. So one night she's playing basketball, and she was, you know, it was that night that she scored four points. She was having a LeBron type, type of game. And, and I remember Courtney just coming out of her mind, like not herself. Tina and I were sitting in the gym and they had these old wooden bleachers, you know, the ones you step on going up and down and you could hear the whole bleacher clacking. And Courtney was running up and down the court and I think they had eight or 10 points in the game, uh, the whole game, but she started yelling at her teammates. I mean, loud, humiliating them. When they weren't, weren't in position, they'd make a bad pass, throw the ball out of bounds. She was sticking her hands in the air, sweet little Courtney. She's like, come on, you guys. You guys are acting like idiots out there. Let's play this thing as a team. Me and Tina are up on the top bleacher. I'm like, what is going on with her? And she just kept doing it. She kept yelling at all of her teammates and, and, and talking to them that was so demeaning. So for a little while, we're sitting there and Tina, she's got a hold of my arm and she is squeezing my arm. Her knuckles are white. And she's like, Joe, do something about your daughter. How many know when your kids do something wrong, it's always your daughter, <laughs> not hers? You guys know what I'm talking about? And she's squeezing my arms, her knuckles are white. She's like, do something about her, Joe. And, and I just sat there, I'm like, Tina, she's gonna work it out, it's gonna be all right. But she kept going. And I'll never forget this, man, it just, it broke my heart because I was embarrassed. I was to the point of embarrassment. The whistle blew, I stood up and I had had enough and I went charging down those bleachers and everybody can hear it. And I'm like, Courtney Joe! The whole gym just stopped. I said, get over here right now. And I'm standing up on the bleacher. I wasn't on the ground. When she got close, I grabbed her by the jersey and I jerked her into me. I said, you get out there and you shut your mouth. You play basketball. You quit yelling at your team. And when you go into that locker room, I want you to apologize to your team and your coaches. And if not, you, you're going to have to deal with me when we get home. And I mean, you know, Courtney's also had a soft heart and she started going, 
I said, go play basketball. And I mean, the whole gym is watching this go down. I'm surprised <laughs> they didn't call the authorities at that point. But she went in, she came back out and she did what I asked her to do. Now, you may be like, well, you embarrassed her. You hurt her, her heart and you should not have done that. Ladies and gentlemen, and she's up here singing. And so will I. She's up here giving her all to God. I'm like, maybe that discipline in that moment was like an arrow in the hand of a warrior that refuses the nonsense of that right there. But I'm going to even take small moments and point my kids in the right direction. Because if I don't and say, she'll work it out. She'll work it out. A lot of us feel like that's how we're supposed to do is work it out. What if I would have said, I don't want to do this to you. I, I don't want to have this conversation. Maybe she doesn't make it here. But maybe that's the reward of what we get to do is to watch our kids following Christ because we're willing to take on those moments of parenting. Now, it leads to my next point. If you dig them, don't worship them, but worship with them. Because sometimes we get to the point where we're like, okay, Courtney, I dig you. I'm totally into you. You're going to work it out. I know that you are. Our culture idolizes its children. I dig my kids. I would do anything for my children. But I wonder if we sense the massive shift that has taken place in the last 40 years in our country. Do we understand how deeply we've been affected by the world's view of children? The bottom line of the world's view is this, kids rule. Don't you question their little hearts and minds if you want to build confident, strong people? then leave the children alone. Don't interfere. Allow them to do what they want and let them express themselves. The reason I fear that is because if you take a note, go to Isaiah chapter 3 and read it this week because Isaiah chapter 3 is talking about a culture that was deteriorating because the children were living in rebellion against their elders. Isaiah also says there were warning signs that let you know that there was a breakdown in the fabric of what was happening in the home and the warning signs to the nation and that it was about to fall was that there was an absence of men and the men were weak. There were arrogant and covetous women that were comparing their possessions and trying to go for things that they really didn't need. And then finally, the last warning was that children were in charge. All those warning signs is breaking down. When you find those three signs, you find a nation that's ready to fall. Here's a nation in Isaiah that's tethering, helpless, and utterly vulnerable to the whims of children. Now, I believe the basic gift of children, ladies and gentlemen, and I champion kids, and I champion their minds, and I champion their talent, and I, I, I just declare right now that God has got so much potential in New Hope kids. They're out here serving. We've got 48 Quest kids that are learning the Word of God, and they're working cameras and working youth, working preschool, working the parking team. So I believe in the potential of our kids but I believe the potential comes out of the potential of parents and moms and dads and guardians to point them in the right direction and not just put them on a pedestal and say, okay, I'll just get you whatever you want and whatever you need. Kids have a basic gift and the basic gift of childhood is their innocence and their carefree play. Protecting their innocence, they don't always get what they want. Our society, we have to be cautious in allowing our children to watch programming. What are they watching? Are you filtering? Are you screening? Are you paying attention to? We have to watch the music that they're listening to. We have to watch the conversations that they lean into that are happening in homes or around adults and people. And your kids are involved in some of those hearing words they should never hear and, and hearing innuendo and things that are happening that they should never hear that create the breakdown of the fabric of the home. They see behaviors that rob them of innocence when what we're supposed to be doing as believers and children of God, we're the ones that's supposed to impress them, not anybody else. You see, I'm not, I don't get impressed by much, but what I want, I want to do is impress my kids. You're like, okay, to impress them. Yeah, you're right. There's not a lot here to impress them, but I want to impress them. 
I'm gonna create character traits and, and features that result from influence in their life. I'm gonna create an image and senses in their mind and allow them to see and hear things that are developing them. Deuteronomy chapter six, verse one, talks about how we are to impress. These are commands. The word says and decrees and laws, the Lord your God directed me to teach you to observe in the land that you're crossing the Jordan to possess so that you, your children and their children after them may fear the Lord your God as long as you live by keeping all the decrees and commands that I give you so that you may enjoy, come on ladies and gentlemen, a long life. That picture I dig my kids, yep, we're not perfect but I want to enjoy life with my family. And as we do, we're teaching them the precepts of God's word, Deuteronomy 6 and 4, if we jump down to verse 4. It says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of your soul, and with all of your strength. Man, repeat that every day. Put that on repeat in your heart and keep declaring that over your house. Come on, say that with me. Love the Lord your God with all of your heart, with all of you, and with all of your strength. And as you do, this is what the word says. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. You ready? Impress them upon your children. You wanna do something to impress your kids? Don't buy them another toy. Don't give them whatever they want. I mean, take time, speak into their life and lead them in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. The word says, talk about these things when you sit at home and when you walk along the road, when you lie down and when you get up. You dig your kids, and man, and discipline them. You, you dig your kids, then worship with them and teach them how to love on God. And then finally, if you dig your kids and you dig them, pray for them. Prayer basics coming up next Saturday. You're like, I, I, Pastor, I, I don't know how to pray for my kids. I, I don't know how to speak life over them. Go online and sign up for prayer basics or just declare. We've been doing that since our oldest daughter, who's gonna be 29 this year, was five years old, we declared prayers over them. You're the head and not the tail. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. How many in this building have heard me say that prayer before over my kids? How many have I told you that? It's exactly right. And are you getting it? You're the head and not the tail. You're fearfully and wonderfully made. His face shines upon you. We declare these prayers. Everything your hands touch will prosper. Let the words of your mouth and the meditation of your heart be pleasing unto you, our rock and our redeemer, O Lord. These these are all prayers. If you don't know what to say, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy, your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done. Whatever those prayers look like, write out a prayer and just declare it over them every day. Because if you dig them, you're going to pray for them. Look at somebody right now and give them a high five and say, I dig my kids. If you dig them, you pray for them. Look at this, Mark chapter 10, verse 13. People were bringing little children to Jesus for him to place his hands on them, but the disciples rebuked them. And when Jesus saw this, he was indignant. He said to them, let the little children come to me and do not hinder them for the kingdom of God belongs to such as these. Truly, I tell you, anyone who will not receive the kingdom of God like a little child will never enter it. Look at verse number 16. And he took the children in his arms placed his hands on them. And what did he do? He blessed them. Bless your kids. Pray for them. It was 1.30 last Tuesday and Alex called from Denver and she's got a great job. She's got great insurance. And, you know, so the, the basic necessities of life, she really doesn't need us for a whole lot. But 1.30 in the morning and she FaceTimed and I heard it and I'm like, Oh my gosh, what, you know, immediately think, is, is everything okay? Because it's, it's uh, 2.30 back her time. So I picked it up and I slid it open and held the phone up. Me and Tina are wiping, you know, eyes and like, sis, what's going on? When she called, she was crying. She said, mom and dad, I'm so sick right now. She goes, I, I, I'm hurting so bad. And she goes, I know it's, I've just got, got flu and, and I'm hurting so bad. And I started thinking about this. She's 1,400 miles away. She knows I can't do anything. 
she knows that she's going to go to the doctor. She'll have to get herself in a car. She's there without her family, just taking on life. Um, she knows she's going to have to take herself to the ER if that's what she needs to do. But she decided to call us 1,400 miles away. And you know why she, died? Why, why she called us? You know, why she, you know why she needed us? Might want to guess? Pray. Pray. We start praying. Tears running down our face, speaking life over her, healing over her body. She called because she knew we would pray for her. See, I couldn't be there to guard her, but I can still guide her in prayer. And mom and dad, whoever's raising the kids in your home, the best thing you can do when you dig your kids, you can dig in and show them how to pray. Bless them. Don't feel ashamed by how it comes out. Just get started. And I promise you, there's going to be a day coming when there will be a reward, even if it's on FaceTime, when they call and they're like, can you just pray for me, mom and dad? Yes, we can do that. We absolutely can do that because God wants to touch your life. What an honor to pray over your children. Proverbs 18, 21, the power of life and death are in the power of the tongue. And when you speak, you have the power, ladies and gentlemen, to hurt or to heal. And that night we got to pray healing prayers. You know, there are some things that you hear that you'll never forget. And I remember walking through my house when my brothers were wayward and we didn't know, some of them didn't know Jesus and we were showing up to church, but just being there, hearing my mom and her voice cry out as she was saying prayers over us, over us behind her door. And I would just stop and listen and begin to cry. And, and her voice would just kind of stagger. And then she'd stop and cry a little bit. And I could hear sniffing in there. And I, I know she's in there wiping her tears and wiping her nose. But I would hear her say, God, I just pray that they would be drawn to you. God, I would pray that they would listen to instruction. I pray that they would walk in humility. I pray that they would understand purity. I would pray, God, that they value you and the word. And she would say those prayers. Ladies and gentlemen, that is something I will never cease to, to not hear because my mom prayed those words. Pray over your kids. Let them hear your voice, not just in instruction, but in prayer as well. Because if you dig your kids, then you're going to love them. You're going to discipline them. You're not going to worship. You're not going to worship them, but worship with them. And you're going to pray for them. Amen, everybody. Come on, let's stand up. Come on, let's stand to our feet. Bow your heads with me. Thank you, Father. There are times when we have all felt like we have failed as parents. We'll feel it again, but I rebuke the enemy right now and declare strength in homes that we would take the authority of parenting for you, God, the gifts that you've given us. Heal homes, Father. I see families reunited. I see prodigals return. Don't tell me he can't do it because he can, ladies and gentlemen. He's a wonder working God. He's a miracle working God. And I declare miracles over every household that are needing a miracle with their children. I declare miracles right now with some who are having behavioral issues. I declare miracles right now of medications that they may be taking that may be hurting their, their bodies or their minds, God. And we just feel like, I, I don't know what to do next. I dig my kids, so I'll pray for my kids. We're gonna love the Lord our God with our heart, soul, mind, and strength, God, and lead the way for our kids to know you. Right now, the greatest gift that we can give is our hearts. We walk in you, we follow you, Lord. And if we don't know you or far from you, maybe we haven't experienced you, maybe our hearts haven't been contrite to you, but you're calling on us to come back to you right now. 
Our eyes are closed because I'm gonna ask you to raise your hand if I'm talking to you and say, Pastor, you're talking to me. I need to know Jesus. I need to know who he is. I wanna come back to him and I want to even parent and lead my family God's way. Would you just raise your hand if I'm talking to you right now? Hands, yes. Yes, thank you, God. Thank you. Thank you, God, for all of those hands. We just declare healing right now. Can we give God a hand clap for all of those hands? Let's pray this prayer. Repeat after me. Jesus, heal my family. I declare peace over my home. God, I give my heart to you and I follow you. Father, I dig my kids. I dig my family. So Father, let me pray for them and understand who you are as I lead them